Now, welcome everybody who has joined us from all around the world. This session is hosted by the American Committee on Asian Economic Studies, jointly with the American Economic Association. Our, topics, our topic is the economics of innovation in Asia. Uh, before we jump in, I'd like to say a, a few words about what the American Committee on Asian Economic Studies has been busy with over the last year and give everybody an introduction to our new initiative, which is a blog called the Asia Economics Blog. We welcome submissions in a variety of categories. Let me run through quickly. Uh, first category is research. And in fact, three of the four papers to be presented today are already posted in blog form on our website. So if you want a quick take on those three papers, uh, you can go to our website, go to the Asia Economics blog and read those posts. And they're getting many hits already. I think Kyun Lee's, who's went up first, has a, a well over 200 hits at this point. Uh, second category is current issues. And of course, we've had a number of posts on COVID and other current issues that have come up in the last year. Uh, third category is reviews. So we're looking for book reviews there or literature reviews. And we have a couple of items in that category. Uh, the fourth category is activities. And in, in that category, we post uh, webinars and online conferences. Uh, if, if there's an event that you would like to have posted, just let me know and we'll put up a notice on that. Uh, and we've got uh, dozens and dozens of items that have uh, taken place and are still in the, the archive uh, if you want to go and look at anything that's been recorded. With everything going online these days, uh, this is a, a great way for people to get the word out to, on an event uh, to, to gather an audience from around the world. Uh, and finally, the fifth category is, is uh, publishing environment. And that was motivated by the loss of our journal, uh, the journal that our organization founded and ran for 30 years, the Journal of Asian Economics, was taken over by Elsevier in the past year. And that really was what motivated us uh, to launch the blog. And Sumner, I want to thank you for the idea. Really, it was Sumner who, who proposed that a blog would be something that we could get up and running quickly and uh, keep uh, an active place in the community of Asian economic scholars. Uh, so we did that and we're getting a lot of traffic on the blog. Um, and if, if uh, you would like to send me an idea for a post, I welcome it. Uh, it's something that we of course need to keep a constant flow of content coming through. So uh, if you're working on a paper and don't want to wait for the long lag to publication to gain some visibility, this blog is a way to do it uh, in about 1,200 words or less and give people just a, a quick insight into what you're doing. Uh, so uh, with that out of the way, uh, let us move on to the, the papers of this session. Uh, check one more time. Do we have Yang Chun here at this point? No. Uh, still not here. Uh, I did send her another email. Maybe she'll join us as we move along. So let's skip to the second paper on the agenda, and that is by Geitzen de, de Vries and Elisabetta Gentile. Uh, they are speaking on fabrication and knowledge activities in Asia. So Geitzen, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Kala. Let me, yes, so it's on full screen now. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here to present this paper. I, I'm sorry, I'm rearranging it a little bit so that I have a full view on my own screen here. So it's a, it's a paper, it's joint work with Elisabetta Gentil. Um, and um, uh, it's a fairly long title. Essentially, we aim to uh, study income convergence by developing Asian economies. And we do that using a global value chain perspective. And as I understood, I have 15 minutes. So what I'll do in this presentation, I'll, 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 I'll walk you through the main elements of this paper. Uh, but if there's 
further detail needed, then we can use the discussion to do so. So I'll, I'll, I'll mainly stay stay with the with the main issues that are in this paper and our, our contribution. Uh, so the starting point for uh, this paper is understanding income convergence in developing Asia. And developing Asia is a, is a case in point. Uh, the, the book by uh, Richard Baldwin uh, titled The Great Convergence uh, focused on several industrializing countries. And most of those industrializing countries are located in developing Asia. So his great convergence story is mainly on several Asian economies. And our question is, what is behind this income convergence that is taking place? Um, do we find evidence that there's upgrading taking place uh, either within activities uh, by means of product or process upgrading or by upgrading in, in the sense of across activities that one moves from lower value added activities to higher ones, uh, which Gary Gareffi famously referred to as functional upgrade. So essentially we have these questions of, um, uh, of, of, of understanding how fast growth in income and productivity is of workers in developing Asia. And we do so from a perspective of global value change, and that will become clear uh, pretty soon. Um, and essentially what we say is uh, we take a two-step approach where we aim to measure the value added, so the income uh, from factors, factors of production, in the, in the, uh, this, this income because, they, because developing Asian firms are carrying out activities and they're carrying out activities, and this is quite important, for manufactured products that are produced anywhere in the world. So essentially, we, we look at the income that firms in developing Asia generate by being involved in final manufactured products that are produced anywhere in the world. So just a simple example, if there's a Volkswagen car being produced in, um, in, in Wolfsburg in Germany, then it may very well be that some developing Asian firms contribute to that car by providing, say, intermediate inputs. Yeah? Or it could be a final manufactured product in Asia itself or in whatever country in the world. We look at all final manufactured products produced anywhere in the world and we trace the value added that firms in developing Asia generate uh, from being involved in producing those products. And we have a good reason to look at those final manufactured products because manufactured products tends to be the most internationally contestable products, right? So a lot of services are not being traded that manufactured products typically do. And that's why we look at those, uh, that, that category uh, where income is being generated um, in. And on top of that, we'll not only just look at labor or capital income that's being generated by developing Asian firms, but we aim to measure income from the different activities that these firms can undertake. And we're going to be very parsimonious uh, by only looking at income from fabrication activities or knowledge activities. And fabrication activities, uh, these are uh, essentially referring to traditional manufacturing activities, uh, say assembly stages or the physical transformation of goods. And these knowledge intensive activities uh, essentially, one can think of these as the, either the pre-fabrication or the post-fabrication activities like R&D and design uh, and sales and marketing type of activities. So it encapsulates a whole range of different tasks that are being performed in just two type of activities, fabrication and knowledge. And in a few slides down, I'll walk you through how we actually measure that. But this is uh, this this getting this point it's it's really important that it's manufactured products finalized products produced anywhere in the world and we trace the income that is being generated from producing those final manufactured products um, and then so defining those fabrication activities those are um, activities being done by workers 
that have occupations that are involved in the physical transformation process. So we have detailed information on the occupations of workers and uh, all occupational categories we assign to fabrication activities if these occupations fit within this being involved in this physical transformation process. Um, and then for workers with occupations involved in pre and post fabrication activities, we assign those as knowledge intensive activities. So we use very detailed occupation data to assign workers to either of these two categories. Um, this is um, uh, this is uh, this is a, a an, an assignment that we propose, but I should note that actually at there's already at the Eurostat and and broader there's an ongoing effort actually to take this further uh, to take this up uh, already in surveys that they would like to actually measure the type of activities that are being undertaken by firms uh, and. Uh, obviously, it's activities that are being done is not reducible to occupations, but we take this as an as a reasonable approximation. And I'm happy to provide you with further details on this, but also in the statistical re realm, there's actually an effort to start measuring it this way, uh, rather than say, just looking at labor income, uh, but this is basically um, looking at income from different types of activities being undertaken. This is uh, conceptually how we think of, uh, of a final manufactured product. So here we have this Volkswagen car again. Uh, it's basically what we have. Um, uh, what we have here is that there's, we identify a global value chain by the country and industry where the last stage of production takes place. Uh, so you see the car in the bottom and then there's different firms in different countries that are contributing to such a final product. And as they contribute, they generate capital and labor income. And essentially what we do is we take those final products and we trace back where the income is coming from. So essentially who is doing what and where. And what we then use is a set of uh, uh, input output tables. This is uh, an example of the world input output table. What we use in the paper is an extension of this world input output data, uh, database where the ADB has made a great effort in actually um, uh, enlarging the set of Asian countries that are being distinguished. And essentially what this table does is it traces the flows of intermediate inputs between industries uh, and the flow of final goods to consumers uh, in different locations in the world. And as they do so, they generate value added. Um, but what one can also do, and that's what's shown in, I guess it's a purple color uh, in the bottom row, is this employment information uh, where one could see, okay, how much workers are involved in a particular industry um, uh, and if one knows the occupations of workers, one also knows whether these are fabrication workers or knowledge workers. And if one also knows the income, uh, one could go a step further in that. So it's, it's essentially what we have here is, a, is, a, is, a, is an input output table that's extended with satellite accounts. Here, this is employment information. Um, and, 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 and once one has all that information, I'm not going to show you, but it's a set of Leontiev type of, uh, of, of uh, Leontiev equations that one uses to then derive who's doing what and where. So and essentially underlying what I'll show you in, the, in a few minutes are results that are based on a Leontiev production function. Uh, and the data is then coming from this world input output data uh, extended by Asian economies. Uh, by the ADB. Uh, we have detailed labor force survey data that allows us to measure the workers by, by uh, occupation in each of the industries. And we use uh, uh, PPPs at constant 2011 prices to measure this global value chain income 
that is being generated. <laughs> so I don't have more time to discuss this in further detail. I could easily spend another 30 minutes, as you'll probably understand by now. Uh, but with that said, I get, I, I expect, uh, or I hope I, I convey the intuition behind the approach that's going on here. Uh, and then what we measure then is, is global value chain income that is being generated. Um, and we express that global value chain income that's given by this uh, variable I um, uh, it, in uh, population terms, so divided by P. So the GVC income per head of the population and a very simple decomposition of splitting that up is by saying, well, it's the amount of workers involved in those global value chains for final manufactured products as a share of the population of that country times the productivity of those workers that are involved in that the in, in, in global value chains of manufactured products. And what one can do is so this what one can do then is to express this relative to the global value chain income per head of the population in the average of OECD countries. And the same one can do with, uh, with the share of workers involved in, in the population relative to the average share in OECD countries and also for productivity. And in that sense, it, gets a, it gives you an alternative way of measuring where income convergence is coming from. So do we observe income convergence from the participation of developing Asia and global value chains? And if so, is that driven by scale or is it driven by productivity? And I don't show it here, but it's fairly simple to actually split this up into convergence coming from scale in fabrication activities or scale in knowledge activities and the same in whether it's coming from productivity improvements relative to the OECD average in fabrication activities or knowledge uh, activities. Kella, how am I doing on time? How much longer? Uh, you've I... got three, three more minutes. Three more minutes, okay. So let me then, then show you the results. We have here this first uh, part, so the GVC income per capita relative to the OECD average. And what one shows is, uh, what one sees is that uh, with the exception of, uh, of, of Taiwan, uh, all Asian economies have uh, per capita GVC incomes that are below 25% of the OECD level, sometimes much below. Uh, but what's also very clear is that over time, it's apparent that developing Asian economies increase their competitive position in manufactured GVCs. And what has been driving this? Uh, well, first of all, if one looks at the productivity ratio for fabrication, which is on the left-hand side, and knowledge, which is on the right-hand side, then it's clear that the productivity ratio is, is, has been converging in most developing Asian countries, but typically from very low levels. So it's that on average, it is still at about only 16%, so 1-6% of the o average OECD level. So there has been convergence in productivity, but from very low levels, such that there's still a large gap in productivity between the OECD average in developing Asia. That's rather different if one looks at the scale ratio. So the amount of workers involved in manufactured GVCs in developing Asia relative to the OECD average. And there one sees that uh, if it's above one, uh, um, uh, it indicates that it's above the OECD average. And actually five Asian economies have a ratio for fabrication jobs, which is on the left-hand side. It is more than two times compared to the OECD average, which is the case for India, Thailand, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Cambodia. The two other Asian economies that have a GVC ratio that's actually three times larger, and Vietnam here at the bottom actually has five times this ratio. For knowledge workers on the right-hand side, it's clear that it's lower compared to fabrication workers. Uh, which is reflecting this global division of labor, where relatively more knowledge workers are involved in, uh, in, in the OECD economies relative to fabrication workers. Uh, yet over time, we also see quite a clear 
increase in the amount of knowledge workers. So that by 2018, various developing Asian economies were actually close or exceeding the average ratio observed in the OECD. So in a nutshell, what our accounting exercise suggests is that the gap in the scale from being involved in manufactured GVC has been closed by most developing Asian economies, yet there remains a considerable gap in the productivity per worker, such that on average developing Asia is at about, is at about one third the GVC income level of the OECD. So with that said, let me conclude. We, uh, our accounting exercise suggests that the convergence process uh, from GVC participation is incomplete. There has been a rapid expansion in the scale of fabrication activities that were carried out, but productivity uh, levels, although they are converging, they started from very low uh, levels. So coming back to the start where I talked about the book by Richard Baldwin on the great convergence, our conclusion would be to say, well, that, that the great convergence is not great yet. <laughs> So let me conclude there and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you. And I have just checked our participants. I don't see Yang Chun <clears throat> having joined us yet. Although if she's here, she could let me know. I guess not. Um, so let's, let's move on to the third paper on the agenda. And we had announced that Kuhn Lee would be the speaker on that. But Kuhn, I think you have a co-author who's going to do the presentation. Could you introduce your co-author, please? Oh, uh, I representing and uh, Dong Yeon Park ADB is uh, joining this session as a panelist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this this paper is on diverse forms of intellectual property rights and particularly the case of Korea. So Feng Kwan, please continue. Okay. Okay, you see my screen, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, it is about a lot of uh, APR, intellect proper right and innovation and pump performance uh, using Korean data. Okay. It goes with the uh, uh, Lei Yong Kang and Dong Yun Park, ADB, sponsored by ADB. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, the, there are big literature on the impact of IPR on innovation and kind of growth. And the issue is the whether we, we need to have a strong IPR or weak IPR. That depends upon your purpose. If you want to boost the innovation, but provide strong IPR protection, whereas you are trying to, interest, uh, try to diffuse innovation. You got to provide some weaker IPR protection. So that's a kind of trade-off. Okay. It can be also discussed in terms of different stages of kind of development. Early stages, you might want to have more diffusion, but at later you might to uh, emphasize more innovation. So depending upon stages, IPR role can be uh, different. Okay. But so, but that's the old uh, 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 tradition. But now people are attention pay attention to whether we should have a, a strong or weak IPR or we should have a diverse IPR form because we have a not only patent but also multi patent called utility model or trademark and design. And this is our focus. We want to uh, discuss changing the role of diverse forms of IPR on innovation and uh, uh, economic growth. So, uh, uh, for example, in my early studies, uh, Kim et al. 2015, uh, very widely cited, we talk about a lot of utility model, sometimes called putty pattern, where it is very useful to promote putty pattern at early stages because it is for minor innovation. Okay, so quite useful for uh, latecomer countries in trying to promote minor forms of innovation based on imitation rather than uh, hardcore innovation. Okay. Also, I've done study on trademark. I found that uh, some sectors are more oriented to the patent, but other are oriented to trademark because some sectors are uh, not oriented to uh, explicit knowledge, so they cannot file patent. In the cases, to capture test knowledge, Trademark can be an alternative. So there can be two different 
pass or uh, sectoral group in terms of the orientation toward filing more patent or filing more trademark. Okay. So today's question is about the design. Okay. And so my empirical work today is more on the role of design compared to patent. Okay. What is design? And uh, with this, this example, we can talk about uh, patent, regular patent, and utility model, or put the patent, and trademark, and design. And design is about more or less appearance of goods, shape of body, or lamp, shape of lamp, and so on. But uh, design become more important to drive innovation because it is acting as a bridge between technical and custom-oriented functions, technical or market-oriented function. And as you know, between the Apple and Samsung uh, uh, the litigation, design was the issue rather, rather than regular patent. Also, design become an important way of uh, differentiating your product, and uh, uh, this affect your sales and marketing uh, uh, success. So, uh, as you get into more advanced stages, uh, how to make your product uh, better in terms of design is very getting more important, and also will affect the kind of growth and sales. Okay. So, in, the, in this experience of Korea, Japan. At the later stages, uh, people pay attention to more design rather than just regular patent or uh, trademark. Okay. And there are some applicable literatures, but not really uh, rigorous, rigorous analysis. They're mostly uh, based on some surveys and some uh, 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 small samples for the limited uh, time period or limited sectors. We are the one force who are doing very large scale fundable data, which has not only uh, design, but also patent, trademark, utility together. That's the one uh, strength of our uh, fundable data spanning many decades. So this shows an uh, uh, overview of the trend of these four types of IPR registration in Korea. And eventually, patent uh, getting large numbers, whereas utility model getting decreased because Korean firm switched from utility model to uh, regular patent because Korea has been switching from imitation-based growth to regular innovation-based growth. Okay, and whereas this and design are getting more and more, also the uh, trademark. So we can see that. Put patent or utility model was serving as a uh, main IPR in early stages. Later on, they uh, uh, replaced by patent design or trademark. Okay. An example is a couple of companies. First, Samsung, okay, one of the most uh, uh, national champion in, from Korea. And this trend showed that uh, Samsung sales. Uh, sky located, but at the same time, Samsung filing more and more design. Actually, in 1993, Samsung chairman declared that Samsung is now going for design. This is where Samsung is lagging behind from uh, uh, advanced countries. You should have a, a better design, otherwise your sales cannot pick up just by uh, the uh, physical, uh, the, 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 the regular you know, innovations. Okay. So they call new design initiative. Okay. And we also have an example from SMEs, something called a uh, company called Nagenak. They are making these types of uh, plastic container, contain li liquid in the, your refrigerator. And this company is very successful with their own brand in the world market, also especially in China market, but they don't buy much patent. Okay, but they file mostly uh, uh, design, okay, and some uh, trademark. So, and one of the implications is that to export in global market, you got to have a good design. Otherwise, you cannot attract customers. Okay? So we, we are utilizing this uh, uh, form level IPR databases spanning five decades from 70 to 2010. 
we have all fundable data for pattern, trademark, design, and footy pattern. Okay. Divide them into three periods, early stages, and left catching up stages, and more maturing stages. We'll see how uh, these different IPR forms uh, has different role or, along the stage of development. And first, we'll look at which sectors tend to file uh, uh, more design than others in terms of several criteria, simple number of design, design for, for companies, design compared to other uh, uh, some other IPR form together, and annual growth rate. And only those sectors who are on the number top, uh, top 10, we classify them as a design intensive sectors. Okay. So this way we try to identify which sectors are more design intensive. Okay. Then we try to figure out what are the main attributes, what makes them file more design. Are they because they are more export oriented or not? Those are the example questions. So we try to uh, divide uh, uh, this whole sectors into two groups, high or low design intense group, to see what are the main attributes in terms of this uh, like export orientation or uh, knowledge explicitness, r and intensity, advertising intensity, capital labor ratio. And these are, we saw, see this is, there are some difference between these two groups of sectors. We see that they are mostly uh, like uh, more export oriented. Design intense sectors are more export oriented. They are less capital uh, intensive and so on. And we test by simple uh, private regressions to find out the main attribute by uh, these regressions. Okay. And uh, uh, this is result. We found that design in team sectors are those who are doing more export in two different criteria, or those are more uh, less capital level, uh, less capital intense sectors. Okay, so it makes sense, right? So to go for foreign market, you got to have better design, and uh, uh, less capital intensive sector tend to uh, go for more design oriented uh, management and uh, product differentiation. Okay. We did the same regression for trademark. Trademark turned out to be more testing knowledge oriented sector. Testing knowledge means that you cannot file patent. So people end up filing uh, trademark rather than filing patent. So this IFR form have a different uh, attribute across uh, sectoral differences. Then we have to see what are the impact of these IPR forms on form performance measured by sales growth. Okay. So this graph shows that aggregate trend, some college between sales growth of firms and their design intensity. And we're going to find out this by uh, some regressions. <clears throat> so we did some uh, panel analysis using both starting from fixed effect and system GMM using sales growth as a, a dependent variable. This is most uh, clear cut uh, performance matters. Okay. Then um, we're trying to explain that by pattern intensity, design intensity, which is number of pattern or design for uh, uh, sales, form ages, R&D intensity, size of company measured by uh, size of employment, advertising intensity. Okay. So these are results for all sectors, not only design intense, but also design less intensive sectors. And for fixed and GMM, this is period one up to mid 80s, Period two, mid 80s to uh, end of uh, 1990. Then after 2010 to 2000, more recent period. Okay. And we show that uh, uh, mostly design become in significant in later period. In this case, period three. Okay. Together with the uh, patent. 
And if you turn to uh, design in team sectors only, it becomes significant only period two, or the interaction term between patent and design becomes significant. So there are some uh, um, complementary impact between patent and designs. And if you turn to uh, uh, low design intense sectors, um, design getting a little bit weaker than uh, other other uh, uh, sample cases like uh, only period three and uh, no interaction and so on. So over time, they show that uh, um, design was not significant in early period, but getting significant only in later period. Uh, that's the two-minute two-minute warning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Finally, to check robustness for in terms of endogeneity, we have a new variable called dummy text one, which when you have a applied design for the first time in your form history, you get the value of one. So uh, using that dummy, try to control endogeneity. Although we did also GML. You also get similar results. You're getting significant in period two and period three, but not significant in uh, early period. It's so, um, consistent result. So in the importance of filing design first, it takes two years lag, then you have impact on sales growth. Okay. So if you summarize, um, first question on which sector tended to file more design, it turned out to be export-oriented sectors, and less capital intensive sectors. So it means different from trademark sector who are filing, uh, who are most advertising intense sectors, who are more testing knowledge oriented sectors and less R&D doing sectors. Question two, what are the impact on form performances? We found that design matters only later period, okay, depending upon the uh, sample, okay. So, Lastly, what are the implications from Polish wise? We found that uh, we see the different IPR getting important in different stages. Early stages where you are lagging in capability, you grow by filing putty pattern ultimate model, which is for minor innovation or trademark. Then there are two best ways. One sector go for uh, mostly uh, trademark oriented sectors. They are mostly domestic market oriented. Okay, the design oriented sectors are those who are going for export oriented. Okay. The globalization, much later period, regular pay to become more important to get with the design or trademark. So, implication is that we got to uh, emphasize not only regular pattern, but also design or trademark, depending upon your sectors, also depending upon whether you're going for foreign market or domestic markets. So, mostly given important in export, we can say that. You got to have a good design, eventually simulate your sales growth in the world market. That's the one uh, strong implication. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And thank you, Kim. We'll move on to the fourth paper, still awaiting the pre presenter for the first paper. The fourth paper is by Gary Jefferson. Uh, his topic is a new approach to growth accounting. He is looking at the China case. Uh, Gary, I'm, I'm mute. Sorry about that. I had just given the conclusions to the paper also. Uh, so, you know, I was explaining that uh, Fung Quan is my, uh, my colleague and co-author. I had seen him on the screen. I was somewhat surprised because it's four o'clock in the morning there and he in uh, Macau and uh, we had agreed that I would present, but if he is here, then he can uh, address any piercing questions others may have. Uh, so <clears throat> this paper is, uh, has a title, as you can see, and it's actually, uh, 
have two papers in one here, a theory paper and then an application of that theory. It's quite a bit. And so I'm going to stick to the text a little more and not ad hoc as much as uh, I might wish in order to adhere to the time limit. So this uh, paper has four motivations. The first is to apply a novel method of growth accounting to China that does uh, two things. First, it assumes that both physical and human capital augmented technical change are fully embodied or embedded in investment. And there are substantial implications from that as we'll see. And secondly, uh, with this model, it enables us to determine whether China's allocation of physical and human capital investment is moving the economy toward greater or less overall efficiency. A second motivation is to test the consistency of data from two sources, China's NBS and the China Human Capital Report, which uh, includes the collection and reporting of uh, substantial data relating to human capital. And that data, that human capital data has been constructed in accord with the Johnson for many lifetime earnings approach. Third motivation is to make adjustments to reconcile differences and inconsistencies between the NBS data and the uh, human capital data set. And finally, we want to uh, use the adjusted data to determine if during 1992 to 2016, our sample period, China's macroeconomy has become more or less efficient. Those are motives. So let me um, review some of the shortcomings of the conventional growth accounting approach. And of course that was uh, rolled out by Solo in 1957 in the article shown and the uh, growth accounting equation there is probably uh, quite familiar to all. Uh, but it does embody some serious problems and particularly inconsistencies with his strangely, you know, these inconsistencies with his article of a, uh, a year earlier, his uh, well-known article on uh, neoclassical growth. And the uh, inconsistencies are that uh, include the representation of technical change, which in growth accounting, as shown at the top of the screen here, um, is represented as Hicks neutral Whereas in uh, the neoclassical growth theory model, the uh, representation is as a Herod neutral labor augmenting technical change. The second problem is that uh, the growth accounting lacks any theoretical structure. Not that uh, growth accounting has any theory, but normally there should be some sort of a backstory to the, uh, the accounting which infers some sources of growth. But um, the, pr the problem is that uh, the growth accounting is structured in a way that's inconsistent with the growth theory. For instance, the growth of the capital stock in growth theory is endogenous, whereas it is represented as being exogenous in, uh, in growth accounting. And so the story that's inferred by growth accounting is entirely inconsistent in its representation of technical change, its uh, representation of the causality among various uh, key variables uh, inconsistent with growth theory. And uh, finally, it's uh, that as growth accounting is ambiguous as in its conventional form in terms of the division between quantity and quality contributions so that uh, the growth of uh, the factor inputs, capital and labor, for example, do, uh, they are intended or they should include only raw unaugmented capital and labor. That is only quantity contributions. And the growth of TFP should only represent technical change. But in practice, there's often uh, ambiguity as to the uh, combination of uh, quality and quantity changes in these variables. So we uh, have a uh, paper that's available on uh, the Social Science Research Network, 
which uh, lays out a different approach, which we call the embodied growth accounting approach. And in that, we uh, have the following um, innovations. We set uh, the growth of G uh, TFP uh, restricted to zero, thereby using this truncated version of the uh, standard growth accounting equation. Hence, we assume that all technical change and productivity growth is embedded in investment that creates the growth of the factor inputs, capital and uh, physical and human capital. And indeed, in endogenous growth theory, this is generally assumed for the growth of human capital in terms of uh, schooling or R&D investment, uh, as in uh, Romer and Lucas's uh, seminal contributions. And it's consistent with author's well-known book on uh, the nature of technical change in which he advances the combination principle, uh, which actually Romer, Weitzman, and Schumpeter embrace, in which technical change requires that matter or physical matter be remixed. Investment is required for the remixing process, which uh, has the effect of linking investment to technical change. And um, so we quickly derive this, and uh, here we have a, a standard generalized production function without uh, the productivity or technology parameter A appearing separately. And we take uh, its total derivative divided by Y, and then I wanted to, uh, show you this uh, 3a in that it does very much embody the intuition of the uh, the approach in that it shows that the growth of output is equal to the sum of the rates of investment of physical capital and human capital both weighted by their respective marginal products and i think this is a very kind of intuitive way of thinking of how uh, investment contributes to, uh, to growth through their respective marginal products. And marginal products also allow, as they change, uh, for variability in the productivity of investment. And then we can apply some uh, standard applications here in order to generate the um, uh, somewhat familiar looking growth accounting equation that is absent the uh, growth of TFP, separate growth of TFP variable. So let me uh, share an abbreviated uh, literature review in which uh, we have Lee. Lee's having been the most intriguing. They report two sets of results for their period 1986 to 2010. They have a baseline estimate using a conventional growth accounting approach in which labor is uh, simply the uh, reported measure of the uh, of the NBS labor force, it uh, results in an estimate of the contribution of uh, total factor productivity growth, representing 30% uh, or over one third of uh, the uh, the growth of output. And then they come back and they substitute human capital and particularly the series from the human capital report uh, for labor and they redo the exercise and they find that it substantially <laughs> reduces uh, output to less than one percent. Uh, we fix A equals one, GTFP is zero and so this is one way in which our approach is uh, different than theirs um, and the second key approach in which ours is different is that they assume that uh, capital's factor output elastic factor share i'm sorry is uh is fixed that is computing an average which they uh, assume is fixed over the entire period so why does the assumption of fixed factor shares matter and here we refer to uh, three classic papers by kennedy samuelson asimoglu who we hereafter refer to as ksa they show that the capital labor substitution elasticity, if it is non-unity, then the proportional change in the capital labor ratio will not result in an equal and opposite proportional change in the factor prices 
Thus, as a result, uh, factor shares will change if the uh, uh, factor substitution elasticity is, is, is non-unitary. That is, if it's not Cobb-Douglas, then the change in the capital labor ratio will change the uh, capital's factor share. Specifically, if the uh, substitution elasticity is less than unity and the capital stock is growing faster, physical capital stock is growing faster than the human capital stock over a sustained period, then uh, capital's factor share will diminish. Hence, our analysis allows for variable factor shares. Okay. Um, so enter the Chinese data. We uh, look at the period 1992 to 2016. We use the NBS data for standard variables and um, also the growth of labor force should be included in that list and uh, data for the growth of human capital and uh, investment. These are S's uh, or investment rates in uh, physical capital. This should be physical capital, sorry, and human capital. And in the first round, what we do is we use the NBS data for the growth of GDP, the factor shares, growth of the capital stock. And then we infer a value for human capital, taking these NBS figures. They don't report anything for human capital. We infer that from these other valuations that the NBS reports. And the result is that the growth of the capital stock turns out to be far greater than that of, uh, of human capital. And indeed, the magnitude of growth of human capital becomes smaller over time, such that by the last period, 2012 to 16, the uh, capital, physical capital stock is growing at a rate that's 10 times that of human capital. Uh, and yet, the uh, uh, capitalist factor of income shares shows uh, it well it shows some period to period variation over the entire sample period, even as the growth of the physical capital stock far outpaces that of uh, human capital. Uh, we see that the uh, factor capitalist factor of income share remains relatively fixed. Um, so in the second round, we combine the NBS data. We substitute this time GH, the human capital, from the uh, human capital report. And uh, it's still the case that uh, the growth of the capital stock exceeds that of human capital, but the difference isn't uh, quite as dramatic and uh, implausible. And uh, so we have to, but one problem is, because human capital is growing more quickly, now the uh, result is that when we add up all the inputs and weight them, use the old weights, or the weights of, from the NBS, uh, the implication is that the growth of output exceeds that which is reported by the NBS. So something has to be adjusted here in order to reconcile these data. Uh, two minutes, Gary. Okay, so we have two more slides here. And um, so the reconciliation that we use, see if I can summarize this, is um, basically we, um, we assume that the rates of growth of uh, output in the factor shares are relatively accurate because they have the same variable in the numerator and the denominator. There's some error bias that should uh, factor or cancel out is between the numerator and denominator. We believe that the error is likely likely to be centered on the factor income shares. So we back out the factor income shares um, with <clears throat> the data on rates of growth from the NBS and for human capital from the uh, human capital report. And we find that over this period, our sample period, it declines that which reconciles and harmonizes the data uh, results in a decline in the capital output ratio from one half to one third. And the results are consistent with KSA and the critical data, the NBS data is consistent with, except for the factor income shares. It's consistent with the human capital data. It's consistent with all the 
assumptions embedded in uh, KSA and uh, standard growth theory are conclusions, okay? So the results imply substantial adjustment across the Chinese economy from 1992 to 2012, particularly after 2001 when China joined the WTO. We see improved overall data consistency uh, while the growth of the capital stock exceeds that of human capital, the disparity declines over time. Uh, we find that uh, consistent with uh, growth theory, uh, capital's output, uh, capital's factor share declines. And uh, once we allow, this is critical, once we allow the factor shares to adjust, the gap between the marginal product of capital and labor, which in the early period had been a factor of two to three, substantially closes by uh, the later period, 2012, 2016. So that uh, by the last period, they substantially converge both in the vicinity of around 10%. So we have some caution. That is, there seems to be, what we're saying is there seems to be improved overall uh, factor allocation and efficiency in China's macroeconomy in the later period. But there's some caution that is given that there's this persistent growth of physical capital in relation to human capital, there may be overshooting of the marginal products and um, a further reduction in uh, capital's uh, factor share. And uh, also it may be that uh, capital's yeah, factor share will below that, fall below that of uh, human capital there are policy implications, briefly. And um, the first is that if you look at the latter half of the 20th century, you see that the rates of return in the US were in the vicinity of 10% for both capital and uh, human capital investment. And um, so this is a, sort of in the same range as that of China. Currently, it implies slower growth for China although likely still substantially higher than in the present OECD economies. And uh, since uh, there's a high, since high GD, high growth of uh, physical capital, as we see, depresses the marginal product of capital as it has substantially over the last uh, 25 years, it's uh, truly necessary that uh, China continue its emphasis on a means of further technological advance. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we still do not have the presenter for the first paper with us. I'm to be the discussant of her paper. And so I'll, I'll go ahead with that and I'll uh, try to fill in some of the substance of the paper, uh, although my slides are really designed around being comments. Uh, but uh, let me see if I can give you a sense uh, of what's involved in the paper be beyond the comments. <clears throat> so uh, this, this is a paper by uh, Yang Chang, and actually uh, I, I realized one of her co-authors, Dong Hyun Park, is here. Dong Hyun? Uh, could could you uh, unmute and maybe respond? Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, uh, do, are you prepared to present the paper or uh, should I go ahead with comments? How long is the presentation? Well, the, the time allotted is 15 minutes. Oh, I see. Then in that case, maybe you should just go ahead and uh, discuss the paper for us. Oh, okay, uh, and if if you feel the the urge, you can feel free to chime in uh, and clarify anything as you wish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Carla. Oh, okay. Uh, let me back up here. Um, so the the paper has uh, gone through a number of titles through various versions. The latest version of the paper that I received had the title "Is City Innovation Accumulative." So it's posed as a question, uh, and, and that gets into the, 
the very foundational question of the motivation for the paper. Is city innovation accumulative? Well, why would it be? Or why wouldn't it be? And what does geography have to do with any pattern of innovation anyway? I guess those are really foundational questions that uh, the paper I feel should start from and, and we need that uh, in the paper. Uh, for the, the blog post on this paper, uh, we've given it more of a descriptive title, The Geography of Innovation in China. Uh, and I didn't set the timer. I'm going to just do that right there. Okay. Uh, so there, there is an antecedent for this work that provides the methodology. It's a paper by Asimoglu and co-authors uh, in 2016. The title of that paper is Innovation Network. And in, in that paper, they're not looking at ge geography, but rather at technology classes. And for this, I think that the intuition is a little easier to grasp. So the question is, do innovations beget innovations across technology classes? And the answer to that is yes, an innovation surge in one technology class gives rise to innovation surges in downstream technology classes through a network. So for example, you could think of uh, semiconductor chips. And if there is major innovation in that area, uh, measured by a lot of new patenting going on, then you would see in downstream categories, say artificial intelligence, a surge of innovation that follows upon that through this technology related network. Uh, whereas maybe for something like mining, it would be inconsequential. They're not at the cutting edge of semiconductor chip development to continue innovations in that area. And so Asimoglu et al. find that there is this networking effect of innovations in some technology classes giving rise to innovations in other classes. The adaptation of that model in the paper by uh, Yang Chan and co-authors is to uh, uh, see if there is an analogous pattern geographically. In other words, is there a network of provinces or cities this is within China, uh, where a surge of innovation in one city would give rise to a, an abundance of innovation in cities that are related to the network. But I, I think uh, the, the innovation is not quite as clear as in the technology class case. So in other words, why, why would there be a network of cities? Why is this information not seized upon across all cities uh, and used in the development of patents. And that's, I think, what we need to hear a story on to motivate the paper. Uh, so why would some cities be downstream of others? Are there geographical barriers to knowledge flows? Uh, and perhaps uh, the relevance of certain technology classes to others is intuitive, but what about the relationship among cities? Uh, so let's back up and uh, look a little bit at the, the data that they use. The data span the period 1985 to 2015. They have information on patents registered in China, uh, numbering 3.6 million, and citation pairs across cities or provinces uh, numbering 5.1 million. So it's really a, a massive data manipulation exercise that they're involved in. Uh, of course, in early years in China, going back to the 1980s, there weren't so many patents and they, the, the authors present a graph showing that there's been real exponential growth and the bulk of this uh, patenting really comes in in the most recent decade. Uh, and they look at 339 cities for pairing these citations, uh, cities that are citing and cities that are receiving citations. Uh, the question, a question that came to my mind was what about other countries? Uh, again, if we want to draw a parallel to the Asimoglu paper, they have a closed system. All of the technology classes are embodied in their system and every site 
uh, from and to comes from some technology class within the system. In the case of this geographical exercise, some of the citations presumably are to patents in other countries. And it would be interesting to have information about the extent to which this is not a closed system, that other countries are involved, even if the empirical analysis is limited to looking at citations within China, uh, some context on the interaction with the rest of the world, I think would be helpful in framing the analysis. Uh, this is a, a table that's taken from the, the blog post on this paper, and it gives a sense of how highly concentrated patenting is. And I, I think uh, none of us would be surprised by that, that there are some provinces in China and provinces, of, of course, include the uh, province level municipalities of, of Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, uh, and so forth. Um, and we see that uh, the concentration is very high. Uh, the number of patents in, in the top rank, top ranks, uh, Jiangsu, Beijing, Guangdong, Zhejiang, Shanghai, are probably where we would expect them to be, uh, either because it's the, the seat of government and academia in the case of Beijing, um, or centers of, of uh, China's major corporations and finance, uh, in the case of Shang Shanghai and the lower Yangtze River Delta provinces. Uh, so we see very large numbers, both uh, citation sources and citation recipients in a small number of provinces. And going on down the list, if we get to the, the bottom, it's Qinghai and Tibet, very little patenting activity uh, measured in the form of citations in those provinces. Um, and then the, the uh, second number here for each, each group is the, num the percentage of citation sources or citation recipients that are inter-province. Um, and so we see around oh, 60 to 70 percent uh, of 60 to 80 percent perhaps uh, that are across provinces, so 20 to 40 percent that are citations interior to a province. Uh, and that, that kind of a pattern comes through in this next figure as well. This is also taken from the blog post. Uh, along the, the rows, um, or going down the rows, uh, we have the, the provinces that are the source of citations. And across the columns, we have the provinces being cited. Uh, what really stands out in this, uh, it's a, a heat matrix, uh, what stands out is that very strong diagonal. And the diagonal tells us that a really heavy preponderance of citations are from provinces to within that same province. So it's localized. Citation activity has a, a very highly localized pattern. Um, and we would expect to see, I think, a, a pretty strong vertical pattern as we do, because these are the provinces being cited. And we know that some produce a lot more patents than others, so we expect them to be cited more. And so we do see uh, more generally a strong vertical pattern. Uh, but we, we also see uh, some variation horizontally. So in other words, some provinces uh, are being cited much more by other specific provinces. It's not a, a even or randomly dispersed where the citations are coming from. And I think that is what needs to be understood. And so far there is, is descriptive analysis, but uh, no information that tells us why to expect certain patterns or interprets the patterns that we get. Uh, and I guess the, the big question being, why is it so localized? Why do we see more citations uh, within provinces to such a, a heavy degree than across provinces? Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, uh, the broader issue, uh, innovation in economic development, uh, which we're looking at in, in this panel, uh, in the China case, of course, the outstanding feature that probably comes to anyone's mind about China is the, the size, uh, the sheer size. And so we would expect a lot of patenting inside of China domestically. Uh, and given the, the great deal of uh, geographic differentiation in terms of economic development, uh, in terms of, of uh, um, large corporations in terms of academic resources for, for research purposes, in terms of finance, uh, we would expect all of those factors to have an influence on the, the concentration. Um, that's, that's my own timer uh, and this is my last slide, so I'll move on through it. Um, I, I think to, to help frame what the authors are doing, I'm going to cite one of the paper presenters in our panel, Kyun Lee, who's written a book, The Art of Economic Ketchup. He kindly gave me a copy of it at last year's meeting. And in preparation for this session, uh, I decided it was time to finally read that book. And I started on it this week, Kyun. And I find it a really fascinating book. And I'm definitely going to finish it. And I plan to write a review for the, the blog the Asia Economics blog, so um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and, and maybe it, it helps us to give a way of, of trying to frame the work that the authors are doing in this paper. Uh, uh, Kuhn Lee, uh, his, his argument in the art of economic catch up uh, is that followers never catch up. You have to do something other than try to follow in the footsteps of countries that have uh, developed previously in order to uh, circumvent the impediments of the middle income track, uh, middle income trap. In other words, each country must innovate, uh, must forge a unique path. And uh, Kuhn uses terms like taking detours or leapfrogging or flying on a balloon. The innovation, even for catching up countries, is critical in order to move beyond the the barriers of the middle income trap. Um, and so I, I wonder if this might be true for localities within China. There's such disparity in the, the uh, development and in the industrial structure, in the kinds of resources, uh, human resources, financial resources, natural resources that are available in different localities. Uh, and so it, it arguably seems to be the case that different localities would be pursuing very different pathways in innovation. And those different pathways in innovation would create a differentiation in the kinds of citing that they do and might motivate the, the what we observe is that there's more local citing. So they're, they're on a path that is distinctive, given their resources, given their development paths, given that they cannot simply follow in the path of China's more developed provinces if they ever hope to catch up in terms of per capita income. Uh, so I, I found the, the juxtaposition of Kuhn's book and reading this paper and looking for a way to motivate and frame what they're doing um, to be potentially very helpful. Um, and it, the, the book also made me think about the, the DeVries and Gentile paper <clears throat> and the diversity of patterns by country. I think uh, the version of this paper that I read, I felt like the authors were perhaps trying to shoehorn all of their countries into a certain pathway for development uh, with respect to fabrication and knowledge activities and employment and productivity. And when we broke down the data by, by country, we really found that the, the patterns were very different. Uh, and maybe Kuhn Lee's book tells us that that's okay, um, that there, there should be differences, that this whole business of catching up means forging a unique path that is really specific to a country. And I, I guess I'm particularly sensitive to thinking in these terms, living in the Philippines, having lived here for, uh, a number of years as I have. Uh, and the, the concern among analysts in the Philippines that 
we don't look like other countries. Uh, Philippines has a, a very high service sector share for its level of income development. Um, and maybe they, taking that as a starting point, the areas of innovation that are important here and the path that they can forge to try to catch up in per capita income terms uh, is different from what those who have gone before have done. Um, and so that is the end of, of my presentation. And uh, let me turn to Donghyun Park. Uh, if there's anything you, that you would like to add on your paper, we, we have, still have some time set aside for your paper. Uh, thanks, Carla. Yeah, hi, Carla. Thanks for the uh, very uh, helpful comments. I, I don't have anything to add at this stage. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, well, we'll move to the discussions of the other papers then. And the, the paper by Geitzen and uh, DeVries and Elisabetta Gentile on fabrication and knowledge activities. Our discussant is Nadia Deutsch. Uh, so please share your screen and unmute. I think it is sharing now. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Carla, and thank you for inviting me to um, discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Um, I I don't see Guyton, but I hope he's in the row. Um, I'm going to repeat a few of the things that he went over and try to stick to my time of seven minutes. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, um, the paper is very clearly written. Uh, it was a very enjoyable read, and um, the, uh, the authors have done tremendous work in compiling this very uh, detailed and uh, large data set, uh, which must have been a very tedious work to compile, merging several data sets in one. I'll talk a little bit more about that. I see it as one of the uh, major contributions of the paper. And from the get-go, I'll tell you that at the very back of the paper, there are more than 30 pages of notes uh, on how the data sets were merged and the various classifications that emerged in, the, in this process. So a lot of work and time um, and efforts um, uh, must have uh, uh, gone into this data compilation. And I assume that the authors will be using uh, this data set for a series of papers. This is perhaps the first one, like a pilot study, which is more of an accounting type of study, but I, um, I suggest at the very end of my discussion that perhaps at the next stage there could be an empirical paper done out of this data set. So once again, the objectives of the study very briefly, uh, as brief as I can, um, uh, as fast as I can go over that, the authors are trying to unravel the impacts of two production-related activities, physical fabrication of goods on one hand and the associated knowledge activities uh, to that production process on the other hand, in, uh, in order to explain the convergence of 15 developing Asian economies to uh, their OECD um, counterpart countries. And the underlying question the authors are asking throughout the study is why is this convergence still incomplete? Publication, as you heard, uh, is defined as um, more or less. I, I apologize, I need to shrink my, uh, my um, uh, screen here because I cannot actually read all of, uh, all of it, or I need to do something else to be able to see the entire screen. I apologize for this disruption. Um, yeah, I think I need to, I need to remove the, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So um, fabrication, as you uh, as you heard, is defined as tasks that uh, involve physical, are involved in physical transformation process, such as assembly of parts and components, uh, manufacturing, Knowledge intensive activities on the other hand are activities that are more related to pre and post fabrication process such as R&D, design, commercialization, engineering, marketing, etc. So the indicators that the authors are using of these fabrication and knowledge intensive activities are number of jobs and amount of income generated within the GBC. And uh, this approach allows the author to basically even tackle uh, two effects, unemployment effect and a productivity effect. Uh, 
I'll talk a little bit more about the unique data set on the next slide. Uh, but the main conclusion of the article, which Geitzen also emphasized, is that uh, the authors are finding a rapid expansion of scale of fabrication as a driver for convergence, but they do not find rapid expansion in the scale of knowledge activities. In other words, most of the convergence that we observe to date, to date of these of developing Asian economies is due to publication activities, physical publication, and not to knowledge activities, knowledge expansion. So uh, the data set, um, they're merging an occupations database, um, which uh, provides them with labor income and number of workers by year industry. Uh, Again, I can see my entire slide, an occupation. And uh, they're merging this with the multi-regional input output tables from um, the Asian development banks to create a very large data set. The 15 Asian economies, which are listed, and by now you know um, from his presentation which countries these are, they were not randomly selected. They were selected based on the fact that they account for 90% of the employment in the region. And also, as you heard from Gaitan, and not only manufacturing industry firms are accounted for in this study, uh, since a firm could be in another sector, but as long as it participates in the GVC of a manufa manufactured good, it's being accounted for. Also, a firm does not need to reside in Asia uh, to be accounted for, in a sense. Uh, for example, they give the example of a, a finalized good, which is produced in America, in the United States but maybe an Asian firm was involved in the GVC uh, via providing some business processing or call centers or whatnot. So this Asian firm is also accounted for. So in that sense, it's not confined to manufacturing only, and it's not confined to Asian uh, firms only. So uh, besides the data set, another contribution, strong contribution that I see in the paper is making the distinction between production and innovation tasks within the GDC to demonstrate uh, the relevance of the GDC's productivity and employment effects for income convergence. Um, the study is, um, is based on this uh, previous article by Buckley et al. 2020, but uh, both articles are, are quite new, so I would, I would say this is a very novel approach what the authors are doing in this uh, article. And uh, since Dyson didn't go over this uh, theoretical background, which is in Buckley, though I'll briefly review it. So um, the, the reasons, there are three reasons of why there, there should be convergence in income in the world. So uh, first, convergence would happen if there is uh, scaling of fabrication, either fabrication or knowledge intensive activities. Second, it would happen if there is a functional upgrading of labor, in other words, a relocation of workers from low to high value added activities within the GVC, which over time allows the firm to basically move from being an assembly firm to own equipment manufacturing firm to ultimately own brand name manufacturing firm. Uh, and the authors do account for that, please take a note, by looking at the share of knowledge in activity workers relative to fabrication workers. So that's the second reason why you might get convergence. The third reason why convergence happens is uh, because of process of grading rather than functional upgrading of labor. And that, uh, that accounts for improvement in technology or product upgrading or via quality design new features. I guess I have two minutes. So based on this theory, thank you. Um, One minute. One minute? Okay, I'll hurry up. So based on this theory, uh, the authors uh, uh, form this ratio. They explain the uh, GVT income per capita ratio with the scale and productivity ratio. And into that, they are able to um, uh, discriminate uh, between fabrication and knowledge uh, intensive activities. So now they have this GVT, GVT knowledge income ratio explained with GVT knowledge worker ratio and GVC knowledge productivity ratio. And um, this allows them to um, actually set up this equation, which, which tells you the GVC income per capita is related to participation in a global value chain and the level of productivity of workers in both the knowledge activities and fabrication activities. Based on that, the authors, uh, 
a great sentiment about that graph. So I, I, I expected that I wouldn't be presenting it uh, for the first time, but here it is. So uh, they see this uh, expansion of propagation activities like very rapidly up and the knowledge activities um, lagging way behind that. So, um, which led to the conclusion that I outlined on my first slide. So I don't have any technical questions for Gaitan, but perhaps a few uh, comments that can uh, allow them for to, to expand the, the study or embarking new studies out of this same data set. So first of all, the, the article sort of starts its conclusion before explaining why some countries in the sample are more successful in closing this knowledge gap uh, than other countries. This is perhaps the most important and valuable policy conclusion that could be given as a recommendation to policymakers. And um, there's no explanation to that. I mean, it, uh, the, the results uh, of uh, the paper really depends on, for example, whether China is strong in the sample or taken out of the sample. So the specific country group in Asia is quite heterogeneous, and there's some countries that are closing this knowledge gap a lot more successfully than others. So my question is, are there any policies that could be taken from the success stories and implemented elsewhere uh, so um, all countries can benefit uh, from, uh, from that policy recommendation. My second question is regarding uh, the data. So uh, the data set uh, does an awesome work in uh, capturing scale effects and functional upgrading of labor effects. But there is no direct data collected on uh, 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 variables related to productivity conversion. For example, uh, design quality, features, and so on of products, upgrades of upgrade products or technologies. There's also no data on capital upgrading. I wonder if anything could be added in those lines to the data set and if, it, if this can potentially result in expanding the analysis and enriching the analysis. Or maybe the others would, would find this to, uh, to be out of focus or want to do. The third question is if this study could be potentially expanded into an empirical paper in the future uh, with setting up an empirical model that uh, uses this uh, labor capital technology GVC ratios involved in both publication, physical publication and knowledge intensive activities in order to explain the rates of convergence. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you, Nadia. And the next paper to be discussed is the paper by Kyun Lee. Uh, on the different forms of intellectual property rights. Our discussant for that is Mike Plummer. So let us uh, share, share your slides now. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, um, well, let me uh, put together this uh, little slideshow. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Kala for putting together such a, an interesting panel. I've, I've learned a lot so far. Um, I'd also like to uh, congratulate the authors on this paper, uh, which is, uh, is very interesting. And, um, you know, given the time constraints, um, I won't give much of an overview of the paper. Um, I thought Kun uh, did a great job of, um, of going over the, the main aspects of it. Um, and besides not being a specialist on empirical IPR, I'll offer just a, a few observations about the contributions of the paper and, you know, ask a few questions that the authors may or may not wish to address in, uh, in future drafts. Um, I think in sum, a main conclusion of the paper uh, that I take away from it is, is that it comes to the intuitive conclusion that different types of IPR matter more for innovation at different stages of economic development. It stresses that patents are not only the only effective form of uh, intellectual property rights, which unfortunately we see sometimes in literature. Um, different types of IPR are more important at different stages of development. Um, and these are links to the link to the structural change that the country undergoes uh, during the development process. And using very rich data sets uh, from Korea, the paper shows that uh, utility patents are the most important perhaps at early stages of development uh, and are applicable to latecomers, uh, but that at later stages of development, um, other IPRs such as designs and trademark patterns and patents matter. 
um, successfully competing in global markets requires both uh, patents and designs. And so uh, these are very useful and very interesting uh, conclusions. Um, I think that if, if this conference were given 30 years ago, uh, you know, the topic would have been considered uh, more esoteric. Um, it's really been in the recent years that IPR related issues have been recognized as being so important for development. Um, and they've also become very controversial in many ways uh, and important to, you know, ongoing policy debates. Uh, for example, intellectual property protection um, in pharmaceuticals have always created significant tension between producing countries and non-producing countries, uh, particularly when it comes to life-saving drugs. And this conflict is already emerging into full view with the COVID-19 vaccines. So um, the fundamental question that's clearly articulated in the paper is, should very strict IPR laws be put into place in order to spur innovation? Uh, but what is the cost of diffusion uh, of these technologies? So what we're looking here is, you know, what the, what, what's the best uh, stance here? What's, if you will, a, a Goldilocks compromise? Um, and it, it looks like from the paper, what's interesting is that even though in general, economic theory doesn't, doesn't yield any optimal guidelines, um, but this paper tells us that it's going to be a function of the level of economic development. Uh, although the, the paper doesn't discuss it by name, um, it also does, it goes to the core of what uh, Khaled mentioned earlier, uh, about the middle income trap and, and what that debate is all about. Um, in any event, the question of how a, a country should develop its IPR rules is critical to its development strategy. And um, one thing I don't see in the paper that I think is important to acknowledge is that uh, when I read the paper, it's, um, it seems as though uh, IPR policies are going to be completely endogenous. Uh, and that may have been true, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, or at you know earlier stages in uh, in you know before this century, uh, but I think that actually uh, there are more external impositions as well right now too, which adds another dimension to the policy debate. I think it's really interested in in looking at this the new RCEP agreement was just agreed to. Um, the IPR chapters are essentially just consistent with the WTO, uh, but the CPTPP chapters, which stem from the TPP have actually quite strict uh, IPR legislation. Um, and so it's not as though a country like Vietnam can just choose whatever kind of uh, policy, uh, policy trajectory it would like to follow. Still, the case of, of Korea is an interesting one. It's a country from, went from being one of the least developed countries in the world in the early 50s to an OECD member in 1996. Um, and one would certainly expect that there would be some interesting lessons from this experience. Um, and I'd say that the art, art, argument put forth uh, in the paper is convincing. Uh, in the case of Korea, certain types of IPR were more important than others during the development process. And I really love the data, spat, uh, data set that they, uh, that they use uh, and the empirical approaches that they use um, uh, are very thorough. Uh, but again, what I'd be concerned with is how generalizable uh, the results would be. My guess is that most of us would agree the Korean development experience is sui generis. Uh, would its results hold in other contexts? Um, and, and we've got other, other uh, examples we could draw from the Korean experience, which has obviously been very successful, um, when it used its system of, of export subsidies that had to be stopped uh, due to administrative actions uh, by developed countries in the 1980s. Um, and so you could never use that Korean experience uh, to sort of say this is an approach the Philippines or Vietnam should take today. Even if this were the best policy to do for other countries, uh, the current international context uh, wouldn't allow it. Um, and since I think that the paper uh, results are strong and convincing, answering this question would actually augment its contribution to the development literature and looking at how generalizable it could be. So it might, it might benefit the experiences of other countries that have gone through the process, you know, Japan or Singapore. Uh, it'd be nice to find a non-regional economy, but I understand that would be difficult and I understand the challenges of databases. Um, but I think it's important. And if not, um, it'd be useful to, you know, have qualifiers uh, to about the generalizability of these results. Um, and I've, by my own timer, I'm, I'm running out of time. 
Um, but I would like to mention that the, uh, the underlying theoretical model um, is important to develop, particularly given this difficulty. I mean, it's one thing to say, I've got this theoretical model and now I'm gonna test it on the Korean case rather than using a Korean case and along the line develop a theoretical model. And I'm afraid at this point in time, it seems that's more what, what the paper um, kind of tends to do. Another thing I'd be interested in seeing is, is what this all means for services. You know, the Korean economy is 60% is services right now, a relative GDP, it's even more than that for employment, uh, poking around the TIVA database. Um, you know, services in Korea constitute 35% of gross exports, uh, which is less than the OECD average, but it's growing. Uh, and given its importance to the future of the Korean economy, you know, and all developed countries, uh, it might be useful to think about this, this work in the context of services and not just uh, in the context of manufacturing. Um, just two minor queries from the paper. Um, in period three, both design and patents are significant, but the interaction term is insignificant. Uh, and it'd be useful to have a story for that. Um, and it also might be useful to see, see a bit more in terms of the stylized facts uh, surrounding R&D in Korea, uh, given its extremely impressive growth. This is all cited. I know the data is there. It might be better. It might be nice to see a bit more of it in the in the uh, in the paper. So, in short, I believe it's a really interesting paper. I learned a great deal uh, from it. The empirical portion is solid. Uh, there used to be useful to put in a more theoretical model uh, from which the applied uh, statistical analysis could flow. Um, given the rising importance of IPR and international commercial relations and the debate over its role in development, including its role in getting through the middle income trap, uh, this paper has the potential to make a very important contribution, I think, to the, the literature. So uh, once again, you know, congratulations to the, to the authors. Thanks, Mike. And the final paper to be discussed is the paper by Gary Jefferson on growth accounting in China. The discussant for that paper is Sumner LaCroix. Sumner? Got it. Yeah. There we go. Um, so um, Gary and Fung's paper, I, I found this really stimulating. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a chaotic paper to read, but if you spend time with it and work your way through to the end, uh, I think it has some really great insights and I, 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 I particularly enjoyed it. Um, uh, has, there's a long introduction at the beginning where um, where they basically try to say, okay, we're going to get rid of the TFP term, and here's the reason why, and that goes on for about 10 pages. And then a lot of the rest of the material in the paper is like packed into the next 16 pages. And, and it, it, I, I understand why the authors did it, because they felt passionate about, 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 about getting rid of the TFP term, but, but it just makes the paper a little bit unbalanced. Um, let, me, let me just give a quick summary of their framework. Um, so again, they, they start off by, 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 by assuming that all technological change affects output as embodied, as embodied investment in physical or human capital. There is no TFP term. There is no disembodied technological uh, change. Everything happens via investment in physical capital that embodies new technologies, and it, or it happens in, uh, via investment in human capital that embodies uh, new technologies, or, or in, some, in some combination of the two is, is, is the most likely. Um, one thing about getting rid of TFP is that is that this allows the factor income shares to change over time. In fact, if you get rid of TFP, you almost have to have the factor income shares change over time, or else there's nothing left to absorb any of the any of the residual in the analysis. Um, so this does allow factor income shares to change over time. In the context of developed economies, that's less of a big deal because we tend to have balanced growth, and that if you have balanced growth, abstracting away from crises, recessions, like we have all the time. Uh, but if you do have balanced growth, then, then um, you'd expect the factor income shares would stay relatively constant over longer periods over longer periods of time. But in a developing economy, I don't think that can be expected. Developing economies mean they're really trying to accumulate large amounts of human and, and physical capital. They start off with different types of endowments. Um, so the paper basically sets up a model that I, I, I think the two authors believe is more appropriate for the developing country context. Um, and then it does a second thing. Uh, it introduces new, uh, new human capital data. It's not that new. I mean, it's been around for a little bit of almost a decade now. Um, but the data set keeps getting better and better. The people at, um, at the, um, at the, at, at the, um, uh, at the, uh, 
CHLR uh, center, keep working on it. And it, it's become a really, it's become a really great data set. Uh, this is by far the best measure of the human capital stock in China. I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. And then the, the Jefferson Kwan paper incorporates data for China using 31 provinces, which some of the earlier papers don't do, makes it not totally applicable a comparison of the results of either. It almost would be, it almost, it, 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 again, it's great that there's more coverage. It just makes it harder to compare with earlier results. And they move to a time frame that's a little different from some earlier papers, which I think is an appropriate time frame, 1992 to 2016, because this tends to incorporate, uh, this really tends to incorporate the market oriented uh, uh, changes. Um, so again, we're looking at two major things here. The authors are saying, okay, we're going to present you with a little different neoclassical growth accounting framework. Okay. And we're also going to give you one big new source of data for human capital. And that source of data for human capital is very different than the data that was put together by the um, by, by NBS, by the National Bureau of Statistics. And, and, and again, I think in the paper, the more I go back and read it, that they uh, just trying to deal with each one of these steps kind of sequentially, um, it, it's a little bit muddled together right now, but it is all there. The more I read the paper, the more I see it's all there. It, it's, it's just a little bit muddled in the presentation. Um, in some ways, this paper builds on, on Lee, which, um, which uh, Gary went over in the, in the presentation, uh, leaves a big group of people, including Barbara Fumani, um and three or four other authors, uh, which essentially says, all right, let's just take standard solo growth accounting uh, framework and let's, let's throw in, let's throw in the, um, the, um, this, the CL, the CHLS data. Um, so they do that using the standard um, solo, the standard solo framework, you know, the Y equals AF, AFKL, where the A, the A picks up some of the um, disembodied, tech, disembodied technical change. And they find that 36% of output growth is due, to, um, is due to TFP, okay. So now they put in the CHLR human capital data and they find, oh, the TFP residual is down to 1%. Because I'm reading this part of the paper, I keep thinking I'm listening to, to Dale Jorgens at that time. Sorry, Gary, we didn't mean to, um, that. I, I think that's a compliment. So, so but, but Dale, whenever I saw Dale talk, Dale was always talking about, we have to get that TFP residual down. We have to get the, the, the paper's kind of written this way in the middle here. And then these guys get the TFP residual down to 1%. So somebody could well say, hey, this is a success right here. The TFP stuff is gone. We're using better measures of human capital. And there's lots of frameworks anyways that say the TFP is due to human capital. It's a function of human capital investment. So by incorporating human capital directly, directly into the framework in a, in a better way than say L, L might just be a, counting number of hours or number of hours adjusted for schooling or number of hours adjusted for schooling and other factors. But the Fermani uh, measure is, is, is really, um, it's, it's, it's a full earnings measure uh, that looks at earnings of both, of both market um, and, and um, it looks at both market and non-market earnings of uh, people in the labor market. So it, it conceptually pulls in all sources, all sources of human capital. Um, it's a big advance. Whether or not it's a big advance to use it in the estimation of growth accounting, one could one could debate, but I think the answer is still there is yes. It's just, it, there's a couple problems with it. Um, okay, and again, Lee used a little different data period. They have 22 of 31 provinces and they estimate for a little different period. They only have 22 provinces because back in 2014, they're using, I think it's 2010 data and they just hadn't estimated it for some of the other provinces at that point. Um, one of the things that comes up with the use of the CHLR data is that it, it generates what Gary, what Gary and, um, and, and Funk call an implausibly high um, human capital to uh, output ratio. It's 11 to 14, because it compares with about six for the United States. I did go back and look at Barbara Frumani's article in Income of Wealth and Barbara says, oh, the, the, um, the HY ratio is 12 and that's just fine. That's, that's the way it is in developing countries. There isn't any capital and everything, all of output depends upon human capital. I did find the differences in perspective really, really striking here, but I'm afraid I'm kind of on, 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 on Gary and Funk's side here. It does seem to me to be implausibly high. Um, and, and they give a couple of reasons. One is Chinese output is, is provided by M MBS is underestimated. That, that's an old story. I, I, that's, that's probably true. There's some level of estimation, but the, CL, the CHLR data includes non-market lifetime income. It's not in GDP. And so we have a human capital stock that's devoted to producing market output and non-market output. And yet all those earnings, all, all, all of that earning potential is dumped into the measure of human capital. 
Um, you know, so the way I look at it is, is CATLR estimates by far the best measure. I know. Okay. But they generate some implausible results. One of the things that that um, that, uh, that that Gary and Flynn find is is when they when they run through their model, they end up with with very implausibly high savings rates of over 100 percent for for a human capital, and I think it's an overall an overall savings ratio of 88 percent. And so what they basically note is, oh, this is this is going back to this is going back to some biases in the CL in the CHLR and MVS data. So if we assume the biases are constant over time, they basically search for a scalar. To make some adjustments, it's a plausible search, and I, I kind of liked what they did here. Um, and and what was the result? The result was I would just go back to I, I would go back to what Gary said um, at the very end was that one of the things it shows is that factor shares change quite a bit in China uh, over the over this period over this uh, almost three decade period. Um, and not only do the factor shares change, but that the rates of return to human capital and physical capital converge. And this is this is what you would expect in an economy making reforms, becoming more efficient over time, um, and growing. I, I I think the paper the paper is really great. I do think it need, I, I do think just that that the presentation needs needs a little bit of work. Um, and I worry about the use of the scalar. I, I I'm I'm worried that readers will stop at the scalar point and just just not be quite sure is the model wrong or is um is this a problem with the data? Um, I, I think it's more a problem with the data. The model has some great insights, and and the use of the scalar really really helps, but I, that part of the paper just needs a little bit more, a little bit more motivation. Um, I'll think about, I, th I think I'm out of time. So yes, there. thank you so much. It's a great read. Uh, we have about 10 minutes now during which we could take questions. There are no questions currently entered. If anybody in the audience uh, or on the panel would like to enter a question, you can do so, but we need to do so quickly. Uh, and if not, I'd like to open the floor for any of the authors to respond or give final remarks uh, and say anything that they felt they didn't have time to say. Uh, so any, any authors, uh, indicate please if you'd like to speak. I would just like to thank Sumner for his uh, remarks. They were uh, very helpful. I was uh, somewhat relieved to know that he uh, didn't choose to uh, sort of tear apart the uh, our revision of standard growth uh, theory or growth accounting. And I uh, appreciate the fact and don't entirely disagree that there are aspects of the paper that as presently presented are a bit chaotic as you uh, put it, and uh, we will uh, return to try to make it uh, more seamless and, uh, and and readable. So thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Kyun? Thank you, uh, Mike, uh, for providing us very uh, constructive and uh, sharp comment. Uh, as we discussed, this paper is about uh, trying to shift literature from strong or weak IPR to diverse IPR forms, starting from Putty Patent. Putty Patent is called Utility Model, and it is German invention as a latecomer against UK. So German tried to recognize my innovation using this something called uh, Utility Model. So this is very useful device to increase my innovation at early stage development. It is adopted by Japan, then copied by China, the Korea, Taiwan, and China. But it, it is still not impo uh, the interest in India or other Anglo-Saxon legal tradition countries. So why could trying to promote the dispute pattern to more countries? And that's one important step in promoting uh, growth in uh, Global South. Then we like to say, now how about trademark or design? And we found that uh, trademark is very important for domestic oriented businesses when they're very weak in technical innovation. So it's not very useful to promote the market growth based in domestic. domestic. Then we found that design matter more in export market. So very uh, complementary role between across the diverse IP platform. Of course, patent is final the, the, the IPR in terms of uh, when you reach the final stage of economic growth or high stage of innovation capabilities. Okay? 
So in the sense, we have to put the paper in the, in the broad context with the strong uh, policy implications. And one of your points about the interaction term between patent and design, not significant. We found we try several variations. We found that it's not robust. So that means patent design has seems to have a separate effect, not that uh, complement each other. So uh, 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 the story, there are some literatures uh, trying to find separate or uh, interesting effect between diverse IP forms. One of the is trademark versus patent. Another one is design versus patent. We found that at least for design and patent, not uh, a strong interaction effect. Okay. That means uh, some company even go for design intensive growth, like Apple. Apple don't have much regular patent, but Apple strong in design. So Apple is something quite different in terms of these IP orientations. <laughs> so, uh, so those stories are uh, compatible with my, my story of no interaction term uh, became, became as significant okay yeah. okay uh maybe uh maybe that's it for the time yeah okay oh, okay uh Gaitan, yes yes i would also like to thank uh, Nad nadia for the very um uh, very very good summary and also the the helpful comments that she gave uh, I appreciate, Nadia, that you underlined the unique data set that we have been constructing and spent considerable time discussing that, which I did not do in the presentation. Um, and I also appreciate the comments that you raised. I think they're good comments. Your first comment was um, uh, 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 basically providing an explanation why some countries were more successful than others in terms of income convergence and this process, what is driving these differences across countries. And I think that resonates quite with uh, quite well with what uh, Carla Rima was pointing out on the diversity that countries are experiencing. So one of the things I took away from this session is that I also should uh, read uh, Professor Lee's book on uh, the unique innovation patterns. I mean, such a it's, a, it's a very big question huh? and one would easily start to reason about, okay, what is actually helping countries to develop? Um, huh? One would easily get to discussions on, on licensing by, by firms huh, of foreign technologies or acquisition actually of foreign firms to, to gain uh, knowledge. Uh, one would also tend to think of uh, homegrown indigenous innovation efforts, right? These national systems of innovation. Uh, but, but we will think about it. If we can also make this more specific for some specific countries on what has been driving this. Uh, so, so I think that's a very good question. And your, your, your other question, well, you had two questions, but essentially they boil down to understanding better understanding what is driving convergence by also including this concept of capital income. Where, where is capital income coming from? Is that also from fabrication or from knowledge uh, income? Uh, and that's a very good question. And I don't have a direct answer to that question. Uh, we do have an indirect answer, which is that we're actually exploring how to measure intangible income in global value chains. And intangible income would typically be in the pre and post fabrication activities, right? That's where most of the intangible income is coming from. And well, it kind of relates to the, the, the framework that uh, Jefferson was, uh, was talking about, uh, where you can measure uh, the rates of return from capital and any supranational returns to capital could be assigned to intangible capital. So. I mean, it, we, have, we don't have enough time to discuss this in further detail, but, but we actually are thinking about this. We don't have a direct answer, but indirectly, we, we have some ways of measuring intangible capital in global value chains. And we're, we, I think it's a good comment. I think we should also incorporate this in, in discussing this as a, as a future way forward. Because as you say, indeed, there's, there's a lot more possible with the, with the data that we have been developing. So thanks for that. Thanks for these comments. It was very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Dong, Dong Hyun, uh, just yeah. a couple minutes remaining. Yeah. Uh, many thanks for your uh, helpful and constructive comments, Kala. Uh, 
In, in particular, I fully agree that um, uh, we, all, we need to motivate this, uh, to why this geography of innovation matters. I mean, as you said, for us in Moglu's paper, the flow of innovations across asset different technology classes, that's quite clear. The intuition is straightforward, but uh, uh, I, I fully agree with you. We, we, we can do a better uh, job of motivating why the flow of innovations across uh, Chinese cities and regions is important. Uh, before, uh, so many thanks for your comments, but before I close, I would like to say, uh, I think, uh, I mean, in economics of innovation, well, it's a, this is a problem with economics in general, but the role of entrepreneurship, right? That really has to be, uh, I think, uh, studied more. So that's a research project I'm beginning because this K and L and innovation and all this, there's very little, uh, Without entrepreneurship, which actually these are the people who hire people, who hire workers, who make investments, without who make innovations like this uh, bio and tech, right? Uh, you know, uh, bio and tech uh, vaccine, right? That was invented by two Turkish German uh, scientists, come entrepreneurs, right? So without this kind of uh, acknowledgement of and uh, somehow incorporating the entrepreneurial process in innovation, I think. Uh, there's, there'll still be a big vacuum. That's a new research project I'm uh, beginning. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Kala. And thank you all. Please check out the Asia Economics blog. We will announce uh, a topic for next year's meetings where I hope we'll all be able to gather in person again. Uh, and so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we welcome content. We need a constant flow of of new material coming in the blog, so please, please get in touch with me about that. And uh, time is up, so have a good day, have a good night wherever you are in the world.